believe on this. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It is um, Yud Zayin Tevet, I think. Hatav Shen Tevet, December 21st, 2021. Parashat um, Shmot. And um, we're continuing our series of Meshay Tanakh, Women in Tanakh. Today we are going to begin. I don't think we'll finish because, it, as you'll soon hear, it's um, so incredibly beautifully um, multi layered. But um, we will be beginning today Miriam Hanimiyat. Meet Miriam. Um, I, I was so excited. I, I got up at like a quarter to six today <laughs> um, because. Um, I was just sort of playing around with how how we wanted to unfold it, you know, kind of do like a map and then go back and fill everything in or I'm still not sure. So we'll just be in the not flow as I just Um so we did say that we wanted to elevate uh, the Shamot of Rivka Bat Esther. And Abigail is still at the Abraham. Let's take a minute just to find Jennifer, Sarah, Layla, Juan, Nacho, Mental, Isser, and Maya Luna. And Yitzchak HaKohen, Ben Yachmi HaKashir HaKohen. May we really, really all know and have experience the Svot Tevot Tov Nir Nidlan Yilka Fuashanina Rafa Malka Vatslavia and uh, the elevation of my sister in law, Stolten Shoshi, and Sarah Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm going to take a breath and maybe I'll be back. So I thought that we, um, I, th I thought being how shot shot, a wonderful place to begin would be with her name. Um, I do hope this week. If it won't be at Nicole's, then perhaps it will be here this week after, because I'm not sure if the comments are back or will be back. But I would definitely like to do a class this week on names because it's Pasha and Shmot. Um, it's a very, very powerful week about what is a name, what is the name in general, what are Hashem's names, what are our names, when how do we need a name, when it comes to when we change it. All these sort of wonderful things. So we'll begin with Miriam's name. So, right now, Leish Yud Mesovut, Miriam. You notice right away a couple of things, right? The first thing you might notice is how deeply connected her name is to water. Right? So, right when you look at her name, you can see that she's got. Yam in there, right? just the ocean. The word may, which means waters, right? Many different waters. Um, and then um, Chazal teach us um, in understanding the Shoshim, the roots, the root letters, the roots of words. But oftentimes, the letter Rish. Sorry for my butcher pronunciation. <laughs> it's, a, it's an American one, it's a pronunciation. Um, is um, 
is the knaliut of something, the familiarish, so that we don't actually count it as part of the shomesh, right? So if we took the wish out of the mean, we would get the word mine. Okay, a wish mine or my wish, right? So with this claw, we have this like the claliut of waters. She, so she's there's something about her when she she's deeply connected to the element of not only watch her, but watch hers. So we'll be exploring which watchers, right? whether the single components of the water, whether the drink with what waters is she working with, is she seemingly joining together. And then another thing you'll notice in her word, in her name, excuse me, is the um, the multiple sort of two sides of the coin of mem reish, or bitter, ma, or reish mem, ram. Ram is to elevate. Ram also is to sing, wonganu Hashem Elohim. You sing in a way that is a Type of singing that it's an elevation. So when she has that quality, if we didn't have the Makudot, and we just saw the letters of her name, Mem Leish Mem, it looks like we have the word Merim. Merim is to lift up or to hold up or to raise up, right? But it's interesting, we have this double quality. Larinia dying is actually to give up. <laughs> right? So it's just, again funny play on words. It means right? To lift somebody, but when I say it about myself, Larinia dying, it means I'm like, forget it. Right? So it's right. So somehow there's a play and a dance happening here of bitterness and elevation. Right? Um, defeated and transformed. And also the word Yarim, very similar to Larim Yadam, right? That we have Yarim, we have Yarim, and, um, and when we spoke about Agoromonu uh, Hashem Elokeinu, it's also used by Chazal, as um, a lashon or a word for tefillah for prayer in general, right? The woman. The woman means to elevate, sing, but it's also used a bit often clear in general sense for tefillah. Right? So we're already just getting the why? Why is this a good way? Because basically, we're looking at the essential elemental um, right? The building blocks of her name, both um, energetically. What are the energetic building blocks that she's working with? And we get that by looking at the individual letters and then the different letter combinations, right? And um, again, so often it will just be the flip side so that we have ma and, and ram, Right? Those are the same energies, just in reverse. Right? Does that make sense? So, um, so already we know that this is, she's got sort of these double qualities of, of possibility, right? That she's working with. So, um, The first time we hear her name, right? That's another very important way that we can begin to understand the essential quality of a person in Tanakh. And also let's, right? The first time they're called by their name. So much so, right, that for example, until the Brit, right? Um, there's several reasons why 
we come visit, you know, the, the baby the night before the bleat. But the essential reason is for shmila, is for protection. For those of you who don't know, there's a minute of the night before a baby gets his birth, that the kids in the neighborhood go and they say, they tell him um, shma, and they give him brachas, and they, they bring protection, right? And the main reason is because when we get our name, we fully come into our body. Like we, we, take, we begin our um, shichut or our mission in the world. Our name and our mission are deeply bound one to another. So much so that there's even a question if our name is our mission. That's certainly true with the angels, with the malach. Mm -hmm. right? By the way, if we understand in this class, for the purpose of this class, Angels, the way that most of Chazal teach, is that angels are kohot, they're energetic forces, right? So that, um, right, we have like the malach, the malach chashman, so it's the energy of electricity, but right? Chazal called it an angel. It's, it's, a, it's another word for um, a very directed force that Hashem uses to... Um, move point A to point B, right, or to unfold the next piece of Hashkacha Petit, that's how Chazal teach it. So an angel will have one name and therefore one force, and therefore one shlichut, or one mission, right? A little more complicated for human beings. But uh, it's very, if you really want to sort of understand the Klaliut, or the general essential principle of a name, not only of a person, but a malach in Tanakh, a place, right? Even a word itself. Look at, as I'll teach us, the first time it's ever birthed, you know, or mentioned, because that's, it's, it's like when it's, it's coming onto stage now, right? Imagine like an actor or an actress, when they make their presence, that's, you get the feel of the character, right? That's important, the first kind of moment that you meet, right? So it's the same way in Tanakh. So interestingly enough, we have stories about some girl, but we don't yet know her name. The first time that we hear her name, the name Miriam. So what, what are some stories we know? So we know that there's a little girl. So, and now when I say stories, we have stories from Midrash. We have stories from, from, from Shot, right? We have Manish stories, sorry. Um, for those of you on recordings, we have stories that come from a body of Torah knowledge called Midrash or Agadita. And um, those are it's a very unique and special body of, of um, It's, it's very misleading to call them legends because that, that already implies that they're not true, um, right? And of course we have the famous Chazal. Everybody who, who believes every Midrash is a fool and everybody who believes no Midrash, right, is what? The Apikosis because it's disconnecting you, but it's disconnecting the energies. There's a totality of energies, the way we experience life through our right hemisphere, through our left hemisphere, through the artistic brain. It's, main, it's not literally true, but it's completely true. It's completely true from the perspective and the language of the artistic brain, right? It's not less true, it's just a different language of experience. So, um, so we have this Midrash, right? When we meet her on the scene, she's five years old and she has a different name. Her name is Pua, right? And Pua goes with her mommy, whose name is Shifra, right? And they go and they're called to Haro's palace. Okay, she's five years old. Now let's just give a little background who her parents are, right? Well, we don't know yet, but we really do know because we've seen this movie. Okay, <laughs> so, so Yocheved and Amram, right, are her parents. We don't know that yet. So, but we're just giving a little background to say that she comes from Shevet Levi. She's, she's got 
quality already of levy. So what is Shevet Levi? So we already know from Mitzrayim, even in Mitzrayim, the Levi'im were not enslaved. So she's got a deep connection to freedom, right? And her bones, because, right? She experiences it through the suffering of others, and she's very connected. But she herself has some deep connection to what? To Kahuna, right? Because this was the priestly class. Right? And to, um, to freedom, right? And to a direct, to, a, to being the priest. So that means the, the, the very spiritual, the Shabbat, right? They're, the, they're really the ones sort of that help us, to help us, accompany us in how to form connection with Hashem. And obviously, they really have this in their family because, right, Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe, right? And by the way, I have to just say that last year I saw this crazy dash that when Amon and Yochev had separated, Yochev married someone else and had two other kids. And guess who they were? And dad and my dad. And dad and my dad, remember, we're going around the camp prophesizing. Dad, because they come from the same family. Right? They're, they're, they're prophets. That's what they're made to be. How hard is he to take the class? Right. So he also married his aunt. Remember, Yochavid is Amram's aunt. Right, none of those things were in place yet. Right. So, but, if, uh, but the truth is, I saw a beautiful, a beautiful teaching about this. Yeah. Why is our history, our entire group and the whole fabric filled with things that are a sore? Yeah. And then we're like, oh, but the Torah wasn't given yet. Oh, but they all kept the Torah already. Because they all, which one is it? <laughs> right? Did they keep the Torah? Then these things are a sore. Did they not? Then we could say, okay, they didn't know yet, but then why go back and say that they all intrinsically knew Torah? Yeah. Well, they didn't because they weren't keeping it, right? So I saw this beautiful piece of Chazal as it said, okay, because what we're doing here is we're creating DNA. So if it was only about perfection, there would be no vessel for Bali Chubas or Gary because the DNA couldn't contain that, right? There would be no receptors for anything but this whole full, perfect, halachic, right, perfection. So what do you do with all anybody who has the DNA that's not that? There would be no, right, no receptor to receive that. So the blueprints themselves had to contain all of these things, right, that were not, you know, Hasidists. This is why we need Hasidists. <laughs> That's a pocket tour. That's an absolute pocket tour. And, and for our own lives, right? For our own lives, meaning we mind the experience. You are about to raise. This works. It said you are about to raise and then it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Um, <laughs> it, like, it popped up from the bottom. It's like you are about to read. <laughs> okay, are we still recording? <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, it was really funny. It was like nine. Oh, God, it's so perfect for our class. So, um, so, right, so understand these are, well, this is her DNA, right? Now, she also, we know she comes from Lady, and what's What's Lady's sort of double-edged coin, right? He's he's the Lady's Lady's going to be the Abba of Kahuna, right? The Kohanim, not only the Kohanim but the Kohanim, um, and the Nevi'im, right? Because Moshe and Aaron, yeah. So this quality 
So they're they're very noble, they're very regal, right? Why? Again, they were not enslaved, right? Um, and they were the priests of the whole of Israel. But another quality that goes along with that, remember Shimon and Levi. So they have this quality of Sitkus, like righteous anger, that they can have their, I'm going to learn how to work with this energy. Right? So, so maybe Josh goes on and says, so there's this little girl, Pua, and her mother, Shifa, and they go to Paro's palace, and Paro um, tells them, and they work as midwives, right? And Paro tells them to throw all of the baby boys, God bless you, um, into the Yaol, into the Nile River. Okay, just pause there, right? This is very, very specific. She's already having an encounter with what? Water. Right? Waters. Men being destroyed through water. And she steps in at five years old and she encounters Paro and she says, Who are you? If you think you can do this to Jewish men. You don't have any right to do this. You're not God. We have God. God made these babies, not you. And how dare you? This is me, gosh, right? Paro understands what a force he's dealing with. Imagine five years old, she's telling off the king of the world. In those days, he was the king of the world. Right? He orders her killed. Okay? This is the first time we hear of her, but we don't know it's her until later. And she's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Her mother, Shifa, from the word Lashapea, to beautify, to fix, to mend, to improve. Right? Like Lashapea and Ashi. She comes to Pearl and she says, Your Majesty, she's, she's a kid. She's a little Katsufa kid. And she's so tiny. She, she, she didn't mean to offend your public. She doesn't even know what she's talking about. She did, right? But she had this quality, and her mother would kind of run after her and she'd be in shift bunch of her pua and be like, No, 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 she didn't mean it. She's just. She's tired, she's cranky, I didn't give her lunch, you know, that kind of thing, right? And then Carl was like, okay. So she had this equality of this, of this word for other men, right? Pua. And Washi, of course, comes and says, right? What is Pua? Pua is the sound you make in the coon, right? But specifically, when you're healing somebody from their suffering, right? Oh, it's okay, it's okay, Shh, it's okay. That quality, right? Oh, yeah, 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 Shh, yeah, yeah. That's cool. It's very different when I learned this as a child and they said, oh, cool, what are the noises that you make to make the baby stop crying? So that sounds more like Right? But I saw this morning that I was preparing. It's specifically this when someone's been sad. In a, in a, in a state of suffering. But she's still not in the meaning. She's going to be poor. Right? Next time we hear about her, she's still not called Maria. So we know that there's a little girl. Very similar story, right? Her father is the head because he's a lady, right? So he's the chief, but that's a McCullen already at this point, right? And he says to his wife that he's not going, he's going to divorce her, right? 
because he's not going to conceive more children and need to have parlors, ser uh, you know, servants um, grow them into the evil. Tells her he's divorcing her and he does divorce her. And as soon as he divorces her, all of the other men divorce their wives as well. Okay. Who is this? Amma, their father, right? Because he was the leader and he was the Kohen, their actions never were only about them. They were a royal family, right? So whatever they did affected everybody. So he left the heaven, everybody else left their wives as well. Miriam, again, we don't know her name yet. This little girl, right, comes to her father and she's tekhani. She's, she, she's got a mouth, this kid, in a good way, but she's got a mouth, right? And she comes and she says, Abba, you're worse than Faro. Wow, right? Do tell, <laughs> right? She says, you're worse than Paro. You know why you're worse than Paro? Okay, I'll tell you three reasons why <laughs> you're worse than Paro. Can you imagine this little skull? I can't, because we live here. <laughs> we, we know these type of kids. Right? Holy chutzpah, the, the, the holy chutzpah. Okay, she says, okay, well, number one, you're worse than Paro. Here, I'm like, I could be, I could be the Nicole. She says, number one, you're worse than Paro, because Paro only made a zera on the boys, right? You understand? But you're also making a zera that no girls will be born. Yes, it's terrible that there is a zera on the boys, but, but you're also making a zera uh, also, also on, the, on the women. Very deep, right? What she says. Okay, that's the first thing she says. Um, wait, this is so good. I want to give you guys the source. Hold on. Uh, and then she says, oh, come on. Hold on. And wait, hold on, hold on one second, because it's so good. The lesson is so good. Um, yeah, she says, oh, what happens when you take notes at 5.30 in the morning? Um, one second. Okay. No, I'll get back to it in a second. Uh, sorry, everybody, we waiting on the recording also. And all right, as we go through the notes, we'll, we'll get back to it. It was just, it was so good. Um, and why am I really not? I know it's in front of my face, but I'm not seeing it. Um, sorry, just give me one more second. Okay. We'll find it as it comes up. It could be that I left these notes on my bed. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going over and over it. Sorry, I don't know. Um, all right, we'll find it. Or it's at my house. Um, okay, but the kids, so she she says to him, listen, um, you know, you're you're bringing us down to the cinema also. Yeah, also for the... Um, and also on the boys, and um, ah, she says Paro is making a zera in Olam Hazeh in this world, but you're making a zera on the Shamas in the Olam Hazeh and Olam Haba. You're not letting these souls come through, right? She said, right. And the third thing she said was, I am.
Ah, right. She says that, okay, Paro, we don't know if Hashem is going to Nikayam his Zal, right? But you're a Tzadik and you're a lady. And whatever Tzadik goes Nikayam, right? So if you, uh, Father, make this Zela that no children will be born, Hashem has to fulfill the Zela because you're a Tzadik. And whatever a Tzadik, um, there's Gozeo, right? Hashem is Nikayam. This is how she talks to her father, right? As a kid, but you hear what did she talk about? Holy chutzpah, right? It's holy chutzpah, holiest chutzpah. And Amram, why do we? How do we know what's holy chutzpah? Because Amram's right? But later we're going to get Aaron Cohen coming, right? The same quality of hot when you're right, and right. When you're right, and right. You have that beautiful quality. The, the, uh, the kahuna, the shepherd lady, right? When you're right, you're right. So this is your, you know, you're right. My daughter, you're right. He married. But, so he remarried her. Oh, wow. right? And again, when he, 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 when he re, yes. Um, he, and, and, and he wasn't was, just bored. Was well, this is so important yeah. also. I mean, again, I don't know. We're not going to go so into this, but just so that you know, Whenever a big soul comes down, it, 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 it's always cloudy, okay? Because why? Because Moshe was born when? Seven months after the storm. Once again. Seven? Sorry, six. Six months after the storm. She was a baby? This is also yeah, remember? Well, no, this is shot. Remember, shot. They hid him in the house for three months. Why did they hide him for three months? Because the Mitzri knew the exact due date of every woman, right? But they had three months with him because she wasn't due yet. But you can imagine the Lashon Hara, and we don't have to imagine it because I'll say, right? This was the Lashon Hara going round. Was it really Amman's child? Is it's it's it, it's very always deeply connected, right? It, it's um I don't want to make a class about this, but it's this idea that when something is very high, Hashem will garb it in confusing low, so to speak, stories, right? Um, actually for the protection of the Nishama. But it causes also shame and humiliation and suffering. Not easy, right? Now, an interesting, beautiful thing to note is if he was born Zayin Adal and he was three months early, when was his real birthday supposed to be? Atantor. Zayin Sima. Wow. So what, what people don't really know, I, I myself only learned this a couple of years ago, Matan Torah, according to Pnei Yusa Torah, was not Vav Sivan. It was Zion Sivan. And later we celebrated Vav Sivan. Weird, right? I just saw this two years ago. Um, we, we celebrate Shavuot, Vav Sivan. In America, we're in Chutzal, it's Vav Sivan and Zayin Sivan. And according to Pini Uta Torah, right, it was really Zayin Sivan. But anyways, his birthday is Matan, was meant to be Matan Torah. So he, he already has, again, this deep connection in his family to waters, and of course, waters is also Torah. Okay, so but she's still not called Miriam in this story. She's a little girl, right? And this is a conversation between Amram and his daughter. But we don't yet know her as Miriam. It's very important, right? These are stories that she didn't yet fully step into her suit. When does the Torah call her Miriam? After Kriyatim Right? When she takes her to pin, right? And she takes the machine, 
and she dances with them. The, 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 the mood, right? And she sings and she dawdles with the women. That's the first time she's called Miriam. She's watching to see what happens to me. No, a hot. A hot, a hot, a hot. She's the sister. Right? She, it's a different quality of hers. She's the sister. But we don't yet know who she, right? her name. Very beautiful, right? So the first time we know her name as Miriam is the Atlantis. Gorgeous, right? So again, I've been debating the whole, isn't that just so beautiful? So I think what I'm going to do is give me a list of her, how Kavata Nishama, right? The, the, some of the gifts and qualities. I want, because I didn't know if I should do it like peekaboo, peekaboo, or, or just give it all to you and then we'll go in and fill it in tonight. But if you're anything like me, you're like, give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> okay. So we'll just, we'll kind of, this will kind of be your map. And then we'll take each piece and we'll unpack it with the stories, okay? So we know she is a dancer and a singer. I'm going to go back and tell you after why, right? She's a dancer and a singer. She is a defender. She is an elevator, not an elevator. <laughs> also, right? She is a shomeret. She's a protector. She, she's a shomeret, a keeper, a guarder, a protector. She is, and this, the Torah specifically tells us this, and she's called, what's her full name? Miriam Hanemiah. She's a Nebiah. Now she's a Nebiah, also with an Ayin. Nebiah with an olive is a prophetess. Nevi'ah, I mean, a flower. She's a flower, so she knows something about deeply connected to the essence of flow. We know that uh, the second time the Torah mentions her, uh, her, her by name, I'll, I'll say more later, but just write this down, okay? She restores husbands to their wives. That's part of her gift, starting from the age of five. She restores husbands to their wives. Now, just to throw in this, I can't keep myself back, <laughs> that the Atiyam Suf is one of the schoolots for finding your soul. It's as as it's a difficulty, yeah. right? So she has this quality of restoring husbands to their wives. But now we can kind of understand then why she was so frustrated about what was happening with Sikora. Right? Because this is part of the quality making show right, just like her brother. Oh. Right? except from the side of the machine. She has this quality of returning, of saving the men, right? Plucking them out from the waters or watching as they're plucked out of the waters, right? Or telling them you've got to get out of the waters, right? She has this quality, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, it's not, she doesn't restore, she does in a roundabout way, she restores children to parents, but her main thing is restoring the masculine to the feminine. Just so, just so, 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 so
all the women or whatever that's the name of the movement that she had this tough kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're starting the masculine life? The feminine part. Okay, now I'm just going to put in here for our map, right? Because this is important. She is somebody who has, a, you know, for, for a week, some act. It's part of a very central part of her story. In other words, she has to experience the consequences of Mishnah and the pain of being disconnected and cut off. In order for her to fulfill her shikut, she has to have that experience, right? What does it feel like to be on the outskirts, on the outsides? Okay, this is so crazy. The Torah has another name for her, and she's called Isha. Let me tell you her name in a second. You're gonna freak out when you hear this name. Mm -hmm. I did, but you know, it was by 30 in the morning. So <laughs> <laughs> um, listen to this. Azuva. Azuva. What is Azuva? The abandoned one. The, the, the forgotten about one. The neglected one. The one who's left. That, that doesn't give me chills. And the Torah calls her Isha Azuva. And it's going through the lineage of who this person married. So who's her husband? Kaya. Ka. 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 Lev. Like. Heart. And it also is connected to the word Kelly. Is it is this azut? Is this azut? The kedusha, right? But when the Torah is going through, he married her, and they had this kid, this kid, this kid, da, 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 right? The Torah doesn't call her Miriam. Ancient Kali, it calls her her Azuba. Ancient Kali. Wait, just the beginning. That isn't that crazy. So how is that connected? Is it if she's too strong and that connection, or where is the Russian power? Is it connected? We can begin to see that because of her experiences of men leaving women, she can't bear that. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right, Paro, that you're doing that. It's not right, Tati, that you did that. It's not right, Moshe, my brother, that you did that. Right? And then, now, Kalev didn't do that to her. We're going to learn out in a second. It's exactly the opposite the Torah tells us. That she was born Muznachat. She was born sick and not pretty. And because she was always sick, she was Muznachat. She was abandoned. She wasn't a cute, pretty little baby and little kid. And, she, and then now we know when she had this katsufanis, right? Even her own Ema is like, I'm sorry, I apologize, Your Majesty. She's a handful, right? Isn't that such a different reading? The opposite, we can see later, Kalev is not like that at all. Kalev fulfills her name, Leharimika. Leharim, right? He picks her up from the dust. And it says after he marries her, her health returns. She becomes beautiful. She it says she becomes Bari and Yafa. So Adirava, she understands what a man can do when he steps into his full self. 
right? And helps to elevate the feminine waters. Isn't this a turn on Miriam you've never heard before? Okay. She's also a midwife and a doula. And the Torah teaches us she was doing this since she was five years old. Her pua name, right? Helping the babies come out through what? The broken waters. It's the exact same waters as the Kriyat Yamsu. It's just on a grander scale. She's been doing this since she's five. She knows how to birth people. What does that mean? She has her birth people. She knows how to bring them through the Mitzrayim, through the constricted places. The Mitzrayim, the Mitzrayim. But what, by, by the way, what is Mitzrayim? Mitzrayim. The waters of constriction. The waters of suffering. Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim. The narrow waters. The birth canal. With me? Good, right? Okay. Um, and the other thing that we know before, we're going to weave, I'm giving you this because I don't know how much we'll cover today, but this is the map, and then we'll go fill stuff back in as much as we can, right? The other thing she's known for is. The Ayam And once again, the waters. Now, it's not a Be'el the way we think. It's not a Be'el that's dug into the ground and stays there. Right? This was a Sela. This was a traveling boulder. Right? So, Remember, they all have interaction with the seda. Moshe has interaction with it, hitting or no, not hitting, right? They all have a yachas to the seda, right? She knows the secrets of how to fall forth waters. So this rock would travel in the machane of the Levi'im, because remember, the Levi'im are the ones who carry the pieces of the Mishpan and the, the, the machane of the Shina, right? Mm -hmm. When they would camp, this rock would be placed mul or across from Petach Ohel Moed, the opening into the tent of meeting, the Ohel Moed. Now, just, just to play with, right? The Ohel Moed is where the Shina meets, right, right? Where prophecy happens. The Ohel Moed is also the space time continuum, which said this before, right? Ohel meaning space, a tent. Moed, Kiva Moed is a time. Times, the cycle, the cycle is a time. So this rock is placed at the entrance, across from the entrance, that's a portal, isn't it? Right? To the space time continuum. You with me? Right? Okay. What would happen was the Nasi, or the prince of every Shevet, would encircle this Sela, or they would call it the Eam Miriam. Right? They would take their Mate, or their staff, and they would sing song of praise to Hashem. Hold on, I'll tell you because I just saw it today. For the first time, the words that they would say, <clears throat> which is so beautiful. And for a second, we'll, we'll pull back there as we go through our notes. Um, Ah, okay. Uh, okay, when we go through the notes, we'll get through, but it, it's connected to Romu Hashem and Okinu. Lari, Miriam. Lari, to 
bring forth, bring up the waters, the feminine waters, right? As feminine waters go from below to above. Feminine waters are waters such as well waters, Maya Mot, right? Um, ocean, rivers, right? These are the feminine waters. Masculine waters are rain, dew. Like they come from above to below. They come from Shemayim, right? The waters that come from Shemayim. But there's waters that come from the Amis. We'll, we'll do more about this after, okay? Please come, um, right? But so now we've just, we've kind of created, um, and the last thing that we're gonna put on our little mat before we start to unpack some of it is that this whole process is her process, right? Shahi, Asa, Atama, her, her, her main shlichut is to turn bitterness into sweetness. Bitter waters, right? Main aliva to main aduki to sweet waters. Or we could say a hamma to mashuchuga, right? Something that's low and bitter to something that is elevated, transformed, and becomes actually the foundation stone for the sweetness. By the way, some people in the Uta say that that rock was the Evanashtia, it was the watering rock because it was watering rock. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. So now we have this overall picture. Now let's take a pause, see if there's any questions, or if I'm less, see if anything I'm clear, and then we'll take each one of those pieces and we'll fill in. Um, can you have some more water? So you yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh, then you are so hot water. Right? Yes, yes, hot water. I have a very general question that you don't have. Like you said, a person's name, it's not conventional, but a person's name is their um, expression, their So, how does that, just the question, how does that, like, I'm not saying, you know, they're, they're running for now, a day, a time. How does it fit? Because it's, yeah. it's an amazing question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that, right. I hope on Thursday we'll, we'll do a class on. Um, I think it would take us too far away from that, but I would just like uh, as an overall, um, I would do it. Sounds a bit wreck. Oh, you wanted to not record? Um, I think as an overall, something to tie the thread. Um, well, everything is with encoded into our mazal, but we are never limited by our mazal, ever. Um, Abraham and Sarah, like Abraham and Sarai, had a particular mazal, and then Hashem changed their name and changed their mazal. We know from the Gemara, one of the things that changes, what are the three things that change our mazal? Name, our place, and our we absolutely change our mazal. Um, well, another way we change our mazal, right, is shu lati das That is the code that we're given to change our mazal, right? Plus the other two from the Gemara, right? You ever want to change your life circumstances? The best way to do that is from the inside out. We try to come at it from the outside in. We think we can change outside circumstances and it, it can have an effect. But the real change that's ever happening is 
the change on the inside. So Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman, tell us, when we hear Mishanem Makom, what do we think? Okay, I moved from Florida and I came to Tzfat, Dugma, right? Rabbeinu says, if you get up right now and you come sit in this chair, your whole module will change. Because you're Mishanem Makom. Why? Well, suddenly you're going to see the whole room from a different perspective, aren't you? Right now, you're seeing me in front of you. What would it be to see me next to you? Dugma, right? Just giving you an example, right? When you're Mishane or Makom, you change because your perspective is changing, you're, right? Because you're telling yourself a certain story. That the story you're telling yourself is whatever, just to say, right? Um, I'm sitting in front of a window and I feel the cold air coming in and uh, I'm experiencing life as being both warm and cold. It's not, I'm just making something up, right? But if you sat by the heater now, you would have a different experience of life. And the story you would tell yourself would be different. And therefore, who you believe you are and what you think is possible in your life would be different. And then other things would open or close based on what you now believe is possible for you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a really good um, tangent. Thank you. Because, and we'll say this, what, when we, um, thank you, you just gave me your heads up for the RD class, <laughs> um, right? But this is the code, because I'll give us, if you're experiencing difficult circumstances, chuva, fila, sadaka. And by the way, it goes in this order. And the last resort is Meshanashem. There's an order to these things. We only do the main change usually when, usually when someone's in a life and death situation, right? Because it means well, wow, we've just really got to change all the way down to the roots. It's not enough to change outer circumstances or even outer beliefs anymore, right? But this is so important. This is, this is a pocket Torah, if there ever was one, right? So life and death cannot necessarily mean physical death. Like if you, like, right? Absolutely. I mean, as a person who reads astrological maps, I can tell you, well, I don't want to get into the details so of it, but <laughs> you will see sometimes in someone's map that they're supposed to die. Well, we do die. We don't always die, um, right? We, we circumstances end. We go through big revolutions in our life. Sometimes it's literally that someone now changes. They do chuva and then they go by their Hebrew name. They're not the same person, right? We know this from all over Torah, but again, main class. Oop, back. Okay. okay. So um, now the other um, um, meaning Chazal give us this is from a Gemara in Sota, Yud Aleph Amud Bet. So the name Pua is not only that she would come to the babies, right, but that she moaned and cried for Amisara. This quality that she had, right, about the suffering, the suffering of the Shina, right? Can you imagine her delivering babies at five years old? So she was seen, I mean, there's not, you know, it's a delicious suffering on one hand when the mommy and the baby are healthy, but it's still suffering, right? And she's right there in the heart, not only not being freaked out, soothing and comforting both mommy and baby. It means a lot of things, right? Okay. So now let's go back and let's talk a little bit about her holy chutzpah, right? <laughs> It's really holy anger. And this is the month of anger. Mm -hmm. 
this is why she's coming onto the scene. Her mama is Yochaved, from the word kaved or the liver, also from the word kaved to be heavy, also from the word kavod to know how to honor and respect oneself and others, right? So this is a quality that she has. She calls out people who are not honoring and respecting, right? The Torah tells us, Zachta Libatim, right? These two women, Shifra and Pua, as Rashi tells us, what was their reward? Zachta Libatim. They were Zoha to build homes. And Rashi tells us, what is this mean, homes? Right? So that Shifra or Yocheved, Zachta Le, Kehuna, right? That the Kahuna, Kohanim, should come through her. And Pua, or Miriam, Zachta, Le, Malchut. The king, specifically David Hamelech, would come through her. Ah, so now we already have another hint to her name, Azura, because this is a quality that runs all throughout Malchus based David, right? Isn't it? To feel unloved, rejected, unwanted, um, not the pretty one, not the wanted one, right? But in her own lifetime, I'm getting ahead of myself because I can't help it. <laughs> she is, she's also like Zeroch. She's a bridger. She knows what it means to be Azura and Muznachat. And then she knows what it means to be deeply loved and beautiful and healthy and whole. Just from childhood, she was sickly. After Kalev marries her, he knows how to elevate the feminine waters to restore her to her full power. By the way, this is um, something I saw last year. I don't understand what it means, but it spoke so deeply to, to my heart. Um, um, oh, his name is escaping me. Uh, who's the um, who's the one who helped? Starts with the chet. Uh, he he helped elevate Moshe's hands at the battle with Amalek. Um, no, it's so close. Yeah, it's really close. It's so close, right? Um, okay, somebody here, Google it or something. Because uh, I saw last year a piece of Torah that blew my mind that said specifically his daughters will not find and be reunited with their true soulmates until four. Four. Thank you. Four. Thank you. Right, so it's, I saw this last year. I don't know what this means to you guys. You can unpack it because it's coming from the same family line. That there's something about his daughters, specifically those feminine daughters, that are yearning for such shleimut of the masculine and feminine daughters that they need it on the level of kalev. So they they. It, it, it happens for them only when there's Yehuda on the team. It's a very deep, very deep tema. Okay, so so that's just another thing we're adding to the here is the is the kahuna and the mahut. And it's very interesting because we have a Gemara that tells us that one of the qualities of Kohanim is their, their on the one hand, their Balei Chesed, their Wodef Shalom, they're, they're uh, ose shalom in abriot, abriot, right? They restore peace. And at the same time, they have this quality, the Gemara says, of very quickly, very suddenly, um, an explosive anger. Like, this is Mama from the Gemara. Right? This is, these are the qualities of, of Komani. It's, um, Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I didn't say that. Okay. Who is Miriam's, Miriam and Paulette's son? Oh, that's why he has this quality. So he has this quality of there, it's specifically not him. Yeah. It says, but not who. The feminine that comes from who, are, they can't settle for anything less than full schlings with their soulmates. Does have anything to do with him holding up bushes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. You've asked two questions, <laughs> all of you. Absolutely, because the Adaini are a man. <sighs> We are dying our Emuna. Whenever his hands would get tired, his Emuna would fall. And Aaron and Kur, one on each side, right? And it's very specific who was there with him. Aaron and Kur, who, the product of the Mayim Nukvim and the Mayim Dukvim, totally making it, right? There was something about Kaleb. He transformed her, he restored her, he changed her from being Azuva. To be Miriam. Miriam from Marim. Marim, the one who elevates, the one who fixes bitterness at its source. Okay, so keep going. Good, huh? Okay. So, and, and second, so uh, to just to give you the generational line. So, Miriam, she ends up. Um, get, uh, coming out from her Betzalel. And from that line comes the Vina Melech. That's from Shmot Rava. Mem Chet Dalek. Yeah. Miriam to Betzalel to the Vina Melech. What we're talking about here is the Yichus of um, Malchus based out of it, right? The Yehuda. Remember that Kala came from Yehuda. Okay, so now let's talk about for a second this idea of a Be'er. First thing we notice about the word Be'er is the word clean, healthy. Yeah. Okay. A be'er is also a place in Tanakh where what always happens in the be'er? You meet your soulmate. Okay, that's the place to go, by the way, any of you are looking. <laughs> I've literally had this in my head for years. This idea to make like a place where people can meet that's Kind of like a kosher pub and call it the air. It's just a yeah. silly joke, but it's in my head all the time. Let's make it happen. Because um, there's something very deep. Why? Because also in Hasidus and Kabbalah, the air is also a lemons for her husband. Because what's his name? Who's Kalem? The air is the heart and the body, the place where all the flow that is right. The incoming flow, the outgoing flow, the connecting waters. What is the word? In the body, what are the connecting waters? In the body, right? We have the blood going into the heart and out of the heart, right? The dirty blood, so to speak, right? And the purified blood, the, the center, the, the, the center, is the heart. Now we'll go back to the to this beautiful piece of Torah that all the Nisi'im would take their matel. Right, they would sing around the Be'er Miriam. And then each one had a hole where the, the Mayan Chaim would burst forth from, right? This, this rock had holes in it. And the holes, each one would have a hole that was connected to their, what? Sinon, their pipe of Shefa. And they would use their mate and they would direct the water into their Nachala. By the way, nachala inheritance is what? Nachala is your river. Right? Nachala is your inheritance, your portion, but it's also nachal Hashem. 
the river of Hay, the river of Lech, a prana, the river of not to mix uh, <laughs> every single religion here, but right, Nahala is also a river of Hashem, a river of Hay, a river of what's Hay? Always. Lech, earthy, the feminine, Mahut, revealing Hashem's Hay, the world, the lower Hay, the K above K. The second Hay is the lowest waters. Those are the waters that are in the Tehom, the waters that bubble up from the Mayan, right? Because we have feminine waters that it's, a, it's an ocean, right? We have feminine waters that it's a, a geyser, a geyser, you know, the ones that we went to these hot waters last week that bubble up from under the ground and they bubble up hot. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the word of Jordan. Islam, there's the Islam. Black stone, they call it. Oh. In Islam, okay. in Islam, okay. there's a black stone that they all dance around as well. I wonder, I wonder if that's from, because where the kippah is sitting in Yerushalayim, mm -hmm. right, the dome of the mosque mm -hmm. is sitting on top of the Evan Hash. <laughs> it's called a kippah. Oh, because it looks like a dome. A dome in Hebrew is, is a kippah because it's sitting on yeah. the watering stone, the foundation stone. Yeah. So they probably have a tradition around the watering stone too because Abraham was their, their father too. They have this big black stone, and apparently, uh, when they're celebrating, they, they all dance around this stone. Oh, beautiful. I'd love to see more about that. Wow, I wonder it's if it came. Oh, it's not Yeah, it's not heating, but not so beautiful. But it probably comes from the same roots. Okay, and then Hazal tell us so all these, you know, now imagine this there's this, a rock in the middle. Now, can you hear the imagery? It's a rock, right? Like a Lev Evan. Through Shira and singing and praising Hashem. Right, something happens in it where then it becomes a lemasa, right? Something rach, remain crying, living waters, right, are shooting out from this what seemed to just be a rock, right? They sing the waters forth. Yeah. Now, understand on a very deep level, what they're doing is calling forth the feminine, right? This is part of the whole story with the hitting of the rock. Because the, the rock is also in Evan. Right? And then the Torah tells us that there was so much water that around every Nahala or every Shevet portion would be tributaries of water. And this Midrash finishes by saying, now listen to the listen to the Lashon. When a woman, not a person, when a woman wanted to visit her neighbor, she would get into a boat. This is all remnants. Oh, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll give you all the sources as we go through. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you all the sources. I, I knew that. I knew you would want that source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wait, so they want to visit. would get into a boat and sail down the river of the outer border of their nachala to. Oh my God! They lived the in the in the <laughs> wait. You yeah. left out the best part. In the desert. Wow. This is so crazy. I knew it. You just that. Isn't that? So, but I mean, so understand. There's past this, right? Yeah. There's right. We're now we're just talking about how cool is it? Rivers in the desert. Okay, but this is, there's past this to unpack. Right? And what does this mean? And what did she do? And how was this? Remember, it says all of this was in her suit. Remember when she dies, right? And we'll get into her death in a minute. Um, Bet Nisan is who you would say. Remember when she dies, what happens? No more the air. Right? So all of this waters. Flow, what do we hear here? Flow, connection, 
the men knowing how to, I, I, I don't use the word arouse here in an inappropriate way. I'm saying arouse, call forth, call up, it aware, awaken, right? The feminine waters in a way where they want to rise up, right? They want to connect, they want to water. And then these waters connect all of the tribes. It's so beautiful. And it's all in her suit. Now, another thing we'll notice is that every one of these brothers and sisters, right? So Aaron and, and um, yeah, but Miriam Aaron Moshe gave us a gift of water in a different form. Yam gives us the Mayim Yahweh, the lower waters, the Mayamot, right? the springs, the waters that, uh, the well waters. Right? You dig a hole and then from somewhere, right, water fills that hole, not rainwater, waters that come from underneath, right? And one of them, gave us the Anmeha Kavod, also water, water in the form of clouds. Still water, but, and those are also Mayim Dukvi, those are waters that come from the heavens, from above, right? Moshe Rabbeinu also gave us water. He gave us water in the form of mud. It is, what, 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 how is the mud yeah. packaged? It's packaged in how? In dew. The mind was packaged in dew. In time. So all three of them are connected to water, different types of waters. Um, okay. So now we're going to get into this quality that she has as being similar. So one thing he said right away is that in her name, right, Ram doesn't just mean to elevate or to uplift, it also means to daven or to sing. And it's, a, it's a specific type of daven and singing, which is praising Hashem. Right, because we have Halelu, Hodu, Lashira, Mizmo, this is Romenu. Romenu. Okay, right? So we have as Yeshua Moshe. Moshe takes the men, as Yeshua Moshe, right? Moshe does this whole song for and with the men. But right after that, that's Ahmiyam, but she does a whole separate song and dance with the women. And very specific instruments, right? That it's, she's not Serach, it's not with the Kino, it's with the Tupin, and the, I'll tell you the other word in a second, it's okay. escaping my head, so drums. Tupin on the drums, and she's, and, and and the tambourines, but I'll tell you the name in a second. Um, I forgot tambourines. Tambourines. I'll tell you the word in a second. Right? These are you now something that we want to. What do we do on a drum? It's the pinky note. It's the heartbeat. The drum is the heartbeat in music. Right? It's it carries the rhythm doesn't carry the melody, right? Every single musical instrument is likened to a part of our body that has a different function. We have the wind, right? Our breath, those are wind instruments such as flutes, right? So when we speak, we're using our wind instrument, our windpipe, literally, our trachea, our bronchia, right? We have, we have a wind instrument. In, uh, what is the drum in our body? 
heart. Boom, 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 boom. In the last month, I have this desire to learn to play the drum. Please do. Yeah, and I even said to my daughter, I said, Me too. Is, I want to learn to play the drum. Me too. Let's yeah. start a hook. Me also. Let's do it. I was just thinking that. It's very important because yeah. drums are and the instruments of all. It's like I even always come to read. Hear that again. So Papa will teach me. It seems such a masculine song, you know, like. You're bursting. Oh, What's the first thing when you get an ultrasound? What's the first thing you hear and see? First you hear, and then you hear. Yes. What's the first music we ever hear? Our mommy's heartbeat. But nothing could be more feminine than a drum. Yeah, it's, it's, like the the it's, it's the first ball. instrument that we ever hear. Let's do it. It's very light. This is the instrument she chose for the Mashiach to dance and song. Not a violin, not a keyboard. There's reasons. Right? It is like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. more earthy yeah. than the heartbeat. Yeah. It's the center of your life force. It's where all the blood is rushing in and out. Is, right? That's exactly it. It is your, and by the way, we know this is true, right? If you, this is a truism. It's silly, but it's, it's true. You know those silly books that they tell you like how to make man fall in love with you, la la. Okay, this is a true thing. How do people come in resonance when their heartbeat syncs up? That's that's called crowd control. That's what we do. That's why in huge concerts, it's so important what the vibration is because the heartbeat of everybody there is syncing to the music. So if it's to elevate, then it's Harsinai. Ish echad, ilev echad. It's not a cute, nice way of saying we were all in peace and getting along. Our heart was beating rhythmically together as one heart. Right? Then you're literally in the deepest connection and flow. Your heart is beating together. By the way, this is often what, ha what happens to, to Zugot in love. Okay? Their rhythm, their, their rhythms start to team to come into resonance. But you also be in the, in the other direction. Right? Absolutely. Like, I've, been, I've been to ball games where I couldn't care less who wins, but when that music starts, you just that's the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> so again, I mean we're getting a little off topic, but the Nazis knew the secret that those were the marches. They knew how to sync everybody's rhythm and then give the message because everybody's rhythm, that it's the same power that is used for good and how Sinai, right? Or any event where there's music and the music is about unity and elevation, it begins by synchronizing everybody's heart and rhythm. You know when you're talking to someone and you're in rhythm together, women do this more than men, we know this, right? And women start to go, oh my God, right? And they start to mirror one another, right? Because they're in sync, right? Have you ever had an experience of talking to someone and your rhythmic patterns, your breathing patterns are so off and it feels jarring, it feels, <laughs> something feels, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're not, able to communicate the message to one another because you're out of sync, right? So this is about sync, syncing as why, not syncing, although yeah. it's connected to syncing, <laughs> it's connected to the going in deep, you know? Um, okay, so this is, now you're going to need to hear all this lushum around her that she's, right, she's the heartbeat of Amisaya. She gathers the women and she leads them in this. What does she lead them in? What is a mechola? A circle. Good. 
What else do you hear in that word? Nicholas. What does it sound like? Chole. Chole. Yes. 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 Remember, she was chole. The midrash tells us she was chole as a child, right? And right. Can you hear now? Nechola chole to be'er bari. Whole spectrum of health. What is health? When everything is in its right connection, its right place, right? It's the right flow, right? This is me, Josh, so much so as to tell us part of health is healthy relationships because a woman would get in her boat, flow, right? Be in flow and make a connection with her friend That's who fun. lived in another shabbat. How gorgeous is our Torah? Right? So to pee, work on the sphira of Malchut. Very essential life force. The rhythm, the heartbeat, right? The boom, the first sounds of life. <laughs> so this story to me too, just the first reaction is like drugs, and that's so loud. You know, women are not supposed to, and I'm like, wait, but this is the Yeruba, you know, and then you look at a time when the woman's voice will want, you know, will be called on, but like now it's at the house, and it's not heard in, in, in the same way that women. Anyway, very, it things together. <laughs> it's very, very important for women to play drums. Very. It connects us to our shalashim, to our roots, to finding our own inner rhythm. Because as women, and I'm still working on this, when people come into my space, I tend to sing with them. I mean, both <laughs> sing and sing because I lose my center. I, I become about their needs, their flow, what they want, what they, especially when they're a mommy. It's, it's, it's much more intense when you're a mother, right? We just, we go out of our own rhythm and we go into their rhythm. They're hungry, they're tired, right? And there's, right, a space of knowing our own and listening to their rhythm, but not just like water, right? Very, it's a very deep woman, woman playing drums is really to come home into your body, right? Because in the, right, we know what it feels like to play a flute, right? That's why we right? like it. Maybe that's why we're not so it's connected. Because it's sexual and like sensual. Really that's why. Right. Because people who are connected to Torah, it, its rhythm is very sensual. Mm -hmm. It's very sexual. Why? Because you feel it down here. Boom, boom, boom. Right? It's, it's just dry. It's, it's dry. Right? It's funny. I love it. I believe that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So it's almost intuitive. But like we like work counter to, I don't know, we're like disconnected. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's we're all different. different. We're all different where when we are. Said, yeah. our connection to when, we, when you said the word primitive, when you were talking about the men dancing around the rock, <laughs> like if the word didn't come to me, but I'm like, it's primitive. <laughs> with, their staff, with their staff. Everyone with their staff. Everyone with their staff. That's it's like Indian dancing. Like yeah. 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 Yes, but it's also. I mean, I didn't want to spell it out, but you understand <laughs> the mate is a remez, right? Mita, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's procreate. Let's procreate. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's connect the lower, the lower waters with the upper waters, right? But see, it's us. It's us that are in galut. So we experience those things and we go, oh, it's not kadosh. This was... Kedusha, because everything was so integrated and filled with God, right? And we got separated from Gaut, but the, the real Gaula is we don't go, oh, that's sensual. Yeah. <laughs> right? We're, we're mamas. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I really want to get to drum class. I think we're going to bring the drums. I'm going to send the drums, not just when it comes. No, but I'm going to tell you. I'm going to 
Oh, and we, there actually are these beautiful tambourines that are, if anyone's ever seen Siona Akashana, right? They're like this big and the sound's not. It's <laughs> boom, 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 boom. It's like it's gorgeous. I love it so much. You know? It's like I'm here. She is here. Life force is here. God is here now. Not, not only that, you know, the like, could we maybe? Yeah. Like I said, we could actually do it. Like, actually, work through it. Like, we have cards or not. It's like, yeah, that is like, I'm here. Like, also, in work, you go to the we need yes. drums. We need drums in my group. Ah, thank you for saying that. So much so. Mm. As doula, I say to women, when you go, ah! right, all the energy goes up. What you want to do is get your tones where your uterus is. Ooh. 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 Like there, you can feel it. Wow, well, yeah. yeah. Right? Mm. Ah is get me out of here. Oh, is let me get this out of me. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, it, and they call her there Miriam, right? Achot Aaron. Atikach Miriam, Achot Aaron. Why not Achot Moshe? So there's something about the two of them and their connection in the arms. Like Moshe goes up the mountain, right? He does lead the Shilahi, right? But his, his, his so much so that later, Awan and Miriam from the story of the Tzavat are gonna understand the same rules don't apply to Moshe, right? Because he, they say to him, right? Listen, we also get Navua. But we didn't leave our husband or our wife. You can get Navua and be earthy. And the message that they got was that's a good message for everybody but Moshe. Moshe is made from different stuff and he has a different tachy. And that's literally the answer that Hashem gives. Right? Don't think that because you understand Navua. You can now comment on what's good for Moshe and Sikora because they have a totally different story. Totally different story. Right? Because that's that's what's upsetting here. Moshe, why can't you combine upper and lower waters? Why can't you be the highest Navi that ever lived and be earthy? Right? And Hashem steps in and says, yeah, that, that's the path for you and our own. That's not yet. Yet. Because what did Moshe want? He wanted to come to the land. Hashem said, not yet. What does it mean to come into the land? To be fully united with Hashem in Malchut, in the earthiness. Right? But not yet. Not yet. With him, it was not yet. Okay, so now we'll get into the. Um, where are we with time? Just it's question 12 or five. Okay. Can you just be like, we smoke a bit, but there was never any other Navi like Moshe. And yeah. all of our thing is to integrate and like have a good Absolutely. <clears throat> but if you learn from the perspective of Hasidus, I, this is, I love this piece so much because. It takes it out of the personal, and Moshe cared so much about every part that the parts were not ready, right? We didn't know yet how to fully integrate body and soul, masculine and feminine, right? Moshe can only be ready when everyone's ready because he's the Nefesh Klali. He's the one that puts all the pieces together. Yeah. Right. If he could do it, that would mean everybody else had already done it. So it actually goes the other way, right? Because, for example, right? And this is very deep and very connected and slightly off topic, but it's okay. <laughs> that Bitsama had the gift of the pot. He knew how to build every individual vessel, right? 
So whereas Moshe was like, I'm sorry, Hashem, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but Salo was like, oh, I got it in my body. I got it. I got the whole thing in my body. Right? And then I know how to make this because I intuitively know how to work with the physical elements, right? Fire, water, rain, um, earthiness, metals, materials, right? Cattle, skins. He knows how to do that, right? Moshe doesn't build the kingly. When it's all done, what do they do? They bring all the pieces of the Mishkan to Moshe and they say, now you put it together. Right? Because he's the Neshama Kali. He does the Haukava. He does the joining, the putting together. But he can't do that until the Manoha is made and the Shulchan is made and the skins are made and the and the Ahwan and the Pahofa and the, right? Okay. So now comes her holy anger again, right? And who is now her holy anger for? Tipola. Right? Because how does she know? How does she know what's going on between them? Yes. Tipola comes and tells her. Question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just I just switch up the time. I'm so totally here. I just want to know how much it's, hour it's or... 10 after 12, right? So we've been here at two hours. Well, we didn't start on that. We, I think yeah, we yeah. started at did we start 10 or 30? Well, I'm sorry. So let's let's aim for 12 30, but we'll see how where you guys are holding up. It's yeah. all okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll see how we can um, so now. Remember, one of her names is Azura. So she can't bear to see another woman feel rejected. Right? And feeling rejected for the sake of spirituality. Right? What, what is, what, what's bothering her? What's bothering her is that she and Aaron both get Nevu'a, but they don't leave their spouse. And specifically, when we say leave here, we're talking about Pilia Olivia, procreating, specifically around procreation. Okay. And I would imagine it's not just procreation. She's saying, is there, is there a higher way to feel God in this world than when a husband and a wife unite? Is there, that, is there a higher way in this world of experiencing godliness than when a husband and a wife unite. Right? Because it's 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 the closest thing to two opposite things becoming one, joining, bonding, a balance of power, right? I mean in the sense of it's not a child or parent, right? It's it's a face-to-face -face relationship. Um, it's a partnering, it's a right? it's she was she right? So she says, listen, none of the Avot left their wives in order to hear God's name, not Abraham, not Yitzhak, not Yaakov, right? And then also not me and not Aro. Why do you think this is the path, right? Doesn't that seem, and I, I don't mean this at all to be disrespectful, I'm saying, doesn't that seem to be similar to Christianity? where the highest thing is to transcend sensuality and sexuality, right? Transcend the need for that. I think that's what she's asking him. Is this the right path? Is this our way? Is this our path, right? Um, now, strangely, it says, right? Hashem got very angry at this. And essentially what he says is none of the normal way that you understand life or what anyone else's Abu Dhat Hashem is applies to Moshe. There's truth in what you're saying, right? Because she was saying, wait, one second. Avram, Yitzvah, Yaakov, they didn't leave their wives and they talked to God all the time. That's, that was her question, right? So now we have another question. 
they were speaking together. Why did Miriam get sad, but not Alma? Not Zipporah. Why not Zipporah? Maybe we can understand and say, well, Zipporah was exempt because she was talking from pain as my husband left me, right? And by the way, this, this, this Torah is it's a very hard Torah. How did she know? How did Sephora tell her? Because Miriam, and again, feel how earthy they were. Miriam comes to her, right? And says to her, how come you're not wearing your jewelry? Every woman would wear their jewelry, right? Your kishutim, right? Why are you not beautifying yourself? What is she asking her, right? Why, why are you in some space where your spirituality is disconnected from your materiality, right? Why are you not decorating your body? <laughs> why are you not celebrating your body? This is what is bothering Miriam, right? Because she's so deeply connected to the lower waters, the feminine waters, what feeds the feminine, right? We like beautiful jewelry. It makes us feel pretty and connected. And by the way, it's so much more than that. Just, just, to, say, just to say a tiny little thing, maybe more maybe like that the angel has a hub and you see, right? Every metal also and every gem has healing properties. Right? She's the air, she's the bria, she's the healthy one. Nothing has to be outside of the realm of Tushanakala. We can plug it in, right? So that we're gonna um, please God when we do the uh, Schmuck class, I got a lot of preparing to do it home. Yeah. But every name every shabbat is specifically connected to a stone because it has a healing property not just the letters of the name <laughs> but but also but also the um they would grind these stones and they would drink them they were right like we forget how earthy we jews are right and and every, I love that. Say that again. I'm a Taurus. I don't. Oh, a Taurus. There you go. Right? So, for example, gold is heating in the body. It's heating. heating. What, is? what is? Gold. gold. Heating. We're heating. The chamen, right? Whereas silver is cooling. Whereas copper and brass are stabilizing or neutralizing. Right? We had all of this Masora. So, for example, why do we wear a gold ring on this finger? Now, it's interesting. We, under the chuppah, put a gold ring on this finger. So if you know holistic medicine, this finger is connected to, who knows? Yes. I thought it was a left. I'm saying in America oh. or whatever, right? Yeah. People put a gold band around this finger. Right. Okay, but we under the chupa, we put it on this finger. And that's the heart. This that's is the heart. The heart yeah. and lungs. Yes. Oh. Heart and lungs, digestive system. What's this one? Take a wild guess. The reproductive system. Wow. <laughs> so you're putting a metal that will warm and heat the reproductive system <laughs> on your finger. And well, contain it, but also fire it up. <laughs> it's both. And wow. circle it, hold it, and also fire it and warm it. Yeah, yeah no, it's, okay, so but I like that. It's like yeah. we begin with the heart and we, begin, we connect the heart with the Yehud, so beautiful, you know? So, so, okay, so this is how this conversation happens. Miriam comes to Tipola and she says, 
why are you not wearing your jewelry? Because women loved their jewelry. And their jewelry meant all kinds of things. The jewelry was your nahut, your presence, your mahus, your power. And it was healing and all the different gemstones and all the different metals and right. And what does she answer? Because my husband is separated from me. So she's really saying, I have no need. Why should I? Why should I make myself beautiful? He doesn't see me. He doesn't notice me. He doesn't, he's not with me. Right? And that's a deep pain for a woman. Cold chicken, a woman who's called Azuva. Right? Another name for Miriam in her youth. Before Kala teaches her what it is to be a beloved woman. Um, could we just pause for a second? I need a break. I'll be right back. Taking up our Venus and bodies. Um, it's, you know, where it says recording, we can just pause. Hi, everybody. Um, this is actually part two. We had a little break and we're back. Um, so this is part two on the class on Miriam and Nidia, also known as Pua, also known as Azuba. Um, and um, we're continuing where we left off the conversation that Miriam was having with her sister-in-law, right, Sipoa. And she, the Torah tells us that she begins by asking Sipoa why she's not um, dressed up, why she is not wearing the jewelry, and um, for the word kishutim. And um, Sipora answers that her, right, her husband has not returned to her, and her husband has never been with her. You, you get definitely vibrationally, like I get a sense, you know, of um, why bother if he doesn't notice me. You know, but why should I wear my nice jewelry? It's... And Sipora is, is upset by this, and she she goes to Awan, right? And and the conversation is who is Miriam? Sorry, well, Sipora is upset, and Miriam is, is upset with and for Sipora, right? Now, and again, from everything that we said this morning. Right, it really makes sense because remember, she's really about connecting the lower and the upper waters, right? And 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 she can't understand why why is there this disconnection here, right? And specific specifically this mitzvah, piyah umivia, right? And um, and Hashem gets very angry at her. So that's already something very deep to sit with, right? He doesn't explain it. It's not rachamim. It's 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 vayichav, akol, right? Chavan, right? He's upset. He's upset at her. He's upset at Awan. Um, she gets sarat, but Aaron does not get sarat, right? Um, so that's a question, right? Um. Why and and if it if we if we keep saying it's about the Lashonaba, right, then how come Sipoa and Aaron don't get Tamat? Right? And the Torah goes out of its way to say, talking, giving us muster here about how harmful Lashon Hara is because it's saying she had every good intention. Her intentions were for unity, because usually the Shankara is to separate. Her intentions were actually for the highest of unity and restoration. She wanted to make peace between Moshe and Sipola. She certainly didn't have an intention of harming or separating, which is usually the intention behind the Shankara. Right? And yet. Right? And yet. Um, so, and then again, we have this very beautiful Lashon. Chazal are giving us this really, really deep um, 
invitation, right? And it says that the parent sabat is kashele. It's it's bright light, and Hazal go on to say, and aza, aza. What do you hear right there? Azut and come on. What is the mazal of this man? Capricorn, the ez, right? And there's even a thing where they say that the sign of this man is a sea goat. A goat, a creature that's a sea goat. Right, it's this combination of the water and the earthiness. <laughs> what does that sound like? She's balancing, right? The waters. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but we're back to the goats. Remember, we've talked about several goats already, right? We talked about Rifka's and Asaph's goats, right? We talked about the goats on Yom Kippur, the two goats. We talked about Tamar. We talked about the um, before. Uh, we talked about the the, the dipping Yosef's kutonit pasin into the blood of the goat. We talked about Tamar and the pikadon, right? The collateral that she received, the signet ring and the staff and the cloak, being in exchange for the payment of the goat. Right? We talked about all of these goats, right? Okay. And now we have a new goat, right? Right? And, 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 and in connection to this kind of hakeona, like look at your behavior, right? And it's always the two goats, meaning trying to blend, integrate, and also discern between earthiness when it's Lashem Shemayim. And it's really about revealing God and creating connection and earthiness when it's about the ego and about separating the material from the spiritual, the body from the soul. And that's always the question. And we're still trying to get it right. So that Tamar does something so outlandishly earthy, <laughs> but in its core, it's completely about unifying, right? Today's my dad's roadside. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to dedicate the money to my father. I'm actually going to tell him where we're at. And what brought it up for me again was this discernment. I woke up from the slip of the dream. Essence of which I don't even remember the dream at all. I was making fine, fine distinctions. And I thought of my dad because he was a lawyer who would look for me. Everywhere for those fine distinctions that make your case. Mm -hmm. You would fight for, particularly mm -hmm. for the rights of people who had no one to fight for them. So mm -hmm. if someone was a, the assessor in San Francisco was a crook legally and he got, you know, got put in jail for it, but he, my dad filed a suit for the citizens who lost all this money because this guy was a crooked assessor. And he filed for the citizens to get, get their money back and things like that. It was just, but this, this fine distinction is this fine distinction. His name is Moshe. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So he was a, a 31 family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know really to walk the path of Azutik Tusha. Mm -hmm. So, right, so, but it says she, she so we're telling us a lot, she turned white Kishele. Right? Where, where do we know that expression from? If your hatain are red, right? albin, I will turn them as white as snow. So there's something about white being kahala, right? Being very, very pure. Isn't it like if somebody, God forbid, is really sick, they turn pale white? We think that they will die. And, I mean, from Torah, we hear Shelet is something being connected to Toha, to being connected to purity, right? So let's take another step back for a moment. And we said again, when we were talking, we lost our thread, we were talking about the Mecholot, circle dances, 
as being connected to holy or sickness, right? And sickness is always a form of connection that's improper or connection that's imbalanced, right? Or connection that shouldn't be connected, right? Proper flow is health. That's the very, what we said, the be'er, the body. Right? The proper flow, what's going in, what's coming out, and what and now, at what time, what place, to who, from whom. Right? That's the definition of health. So she's got this theme of health and sickness. Right? Remember, we said she, we learned a Natasha today that says that she was very sickly as a child. That she was not beautiful. And she was very sickly. So she was abandoned. And it was only after her marriage to Kalev that she came into her beauty and, and specifically into Bulut and Yehi, right? Health and beauty. Okay, so how do you decide to do that? When you decide this is someone sick from you. Look at his name. You saw a heart. You saw him work. He was able to rise up and see the feminine. Yeah, until it's a feminine. You saw his. his He's purpose. also, we know he sees deeply. How do we know he sees deeply? Where else do we know that he mm -hmm. sees deeply? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. he's above. He sees below. He sees through. Yeah. He sees above, below, through. Yeah. He sees with his life. Oh, that was good. He doesn't see with his eyes. He sees with his heart. So, right. And remember, he's Malchus based David. Malchus based David. The David of the Enayim. Right, they see with their eyes of Hashem, they, they see through Hashem's eyes. Mm -hmm. We must see through Hashem's eyes, that's what we are through Hashem's eyes. If we really want to see, if we really want to see, mm -hmm. that's the gift of all these things. That um, can you say a little bit about the nature of the nature of the nature of God's anger. Towards yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, but yes, um, yes. Just hang on for one second. Um, we'll just end this one last piece with the, with the, with the to add in the word mechila. We have the whole dance, right? Whole or the profane or whole hole to be sick. By the way. There's a deep connection that when we casualize things that are holy, it makes us sick. For example, casualize sexual intimacy, right? Because whole and whole, you hear that? Right? It's the kadusha, it's not casualizing it, it's halal, right? The empty space, absolutely. And then we have this word for the is healing circle dances. Healing circle dances is restoring flow. It's also very connected to what we said before about changing your makom. When you're in dance, you change your mazal because you're the shamer makom. You're changing your position, you're changing your perspective. Yeah, so let's say more about the anger, right? The well, one thing that we're going to say is that we're learning in this moment about chaos and about logis, right? And about chawana. They're all different ways of expressing anger. Okay. Here it's specifically right. What's the opposite of chawan af? Blessed erchapayim. 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 By the way, is connected to kader, or the. It's a it's a clear white. It's a white that contains all colors. We're learning this quality of anger 
that anger can shape the energies and actually shape things back into proper and full and whole connection. Right? It's, it's like an earthquake. Hashem goes, but it's actually, it's actually settling things back into their real and proper place. It got out of alignment. It's like a chiropractic adjustment. There's something specifically with the feminine and the feminine waters, and specifically through the Aliyah, because we see Alan spoke, he didn't get Sahat. See, Gora spoke, she didn't get Sahat. It was specifically a, re a healing from the Aliyah. And something specifically was getting fixed and healed for her. <clears throat> Um, so the secret here brings down Shenaki Basalahim, and it's talking about that her skin turned white, 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 like luminous, bright white. What else does that remind you of? That's beautiful. That's like a light, yes. The moon. Okay. The feminine. Okay, and then Moshe steps in, right? And says, right? Kelina, I'm far back. Shortest to be uh, almost done. <laughs> Kelna, so has all come and pass. This is his sister. Why did he talk in such a short tula? Why is Moshe Rabbeinu writing it here? Go deeper, go higher, go more specific, right? What is this formula, right? Kelna, fa na, la. So this is beautiful. The Chazal going to tell us here. This is so beautiful. This is again that Azut from Shevet Levi. Okay. Moshe Rabbeinu comes and says to Hashem, you taught me now how to heal everything. Specifically how to heal Nega'i. How to heal wounds. If you don't heal her, I will. <laughs> Beautiful quality of Azut Dushan. But he made it very short to be that so that the Minister L wouldn't say, and this is what Kazan teaches us, his sister's sick and he's wasting all this time dominating. Why doesn't he go take care of her? Again, what are we, what are we exploring here? What are we talking about? Right? What is real spirituality? What is real physicality? Right? Is someone standing in front of us and they're sick? Right? This is the question. We're not saying yes or no. We're just exploring. Right? Again, these goats. Right? The goat is the representation of the azut, the might, the strength, the physicality, Capricorn. Capricorn is an earth sign. It's an earth sign that is great at business. It's the most, it's the top of the natal chart. They are the ones who are the most ambitious in the physical world, right? They want to be the best at everything. By the way, they also want to be the best at spirituality because they, just, they want to be the best. <laughs> yeah, they want to master, right? Climb up the mountain, right? Um, Right? So we're, we're exploring like, you know, all of these questions. By the way, Chazal had a discussion in Mazal Yisrael, okay? We're not bound by, what does that mean? We're not bound by our astrological chart. It means that these are forces of nature, both our own inner nature, right? We're born with a particular combination and balance 
of elements, earth, air, wind, fire within us, right? And how they manifest within us and how we use those to act upon our sviva, our environment, and how our environment acts upon us largely in response to our qualities, right? We're gentle, we get a certain response. If we're fiery, we get a certain response. If we're whatever, right? So we so, so then Chazal come and tell us, Ein mazal what does this mean? Right? It doesn't mean we don't have astrological charts. It doesn't mean that we don't have a nature that we were born, you know, with a propensity for sweetness or for impatience or for gentleness or for uh, we like material things or we don't like material things or whatever, right? We're born with these propensities. What Kazal is teaching us is that there is a power that is greater than any one of these elements or any combination of these elements. And when a person puts their faith and their trust and their belief in that power, then they're free from being a slave to the limitation of whatever powers are moving through them. In other words, right? It's saying, yes, we have an essential inner nature. But if we do the work asking Hashem to help us refine that nature, then we know that Hashem works mida keneged mida. If you step out of your nature, then Hashem steps out of his nature. And then your whole relationship is existing on a level of beyond what you think is possible and beyond um, whatever you limitations, right? <clears throat> you think, so if you get to the core of truly knowing that you're not limited by your nature, right? In other words, if someone say, listen, I get angry. That's just who I am, okay? So then that's how the world has shown and everything will respond to you. But if the person says, yes, I was born with a um, propensity to get anger, angry, but every day I ask Hashem, you know, please help me to elevate that energy, right? And the first step might be hafna'ah, please help me to subjugate that energy. But later, please help me to use that energy because it's all just you in different forms. How do I use this vibrant, dynamic, passionate, heating, energy that you put into me, right? Mm -hmm. Show me. And, and so that I, I'm, I'm no longer bound by using it in destructive ways or self-destructive ways, right? And then teach me how to elevate your cupboard in the world. Dafka through that. Dafka, dafka through that, right? Mm -hmm. So Miriam is undergoing a very specific cleansing here that her greatest greatest gift is responding to social injustice right in a fiery way and to responding between disconnection between the physical and the spiritual that it's all spiritual meaning it's all one this physical is spiritual the spiritual is physical it's all one god it's all expressions of the one god shamayim ba'aretz masculine and feminine, right? That's what she starts by saying to her father, you're worse than Paro, right? Because Paro is going after the boys, but you're going after the unification of it all. You're going after the boys and the girls, the men and the women, right? By what? Cutting, killing, disconnecting, right? In other words, she's saying, yeah, Paro affects the men, but we still have the women. That, that was her message. She was saying, women, you don't understand how powerful you are. Yeah, Paro is throwing the men in. And so the men gave up. Forget it. There's no hope. And what, what is her crying? Don't you understand? 
women in their power are more powerful than Paul. That's what she said. That's, that's quite a message, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Um, right? And you can see in the story, first, look at all the men that she calls out. Calls out. She calls out her dad, mm -hmm. Amram. She calls out Haro. Mm -hmm. And now she's calling out Moshe. Mm -hmm. And Hashem says, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, sister. Uh, uh, that's for you. Yeah. I get I get that I gave you a gift to call out men, but it stops at my, at my beloved notion. I guess she needed to reach that limit, you know, that yeah. there is yeah. her power limited. And also, I'm just going to focus on the mom's older sister and your brother. They have their place of power. You the little girl in the book. She was in control. She was taking care of him. She made him alive, basically. Got out of the motherly nursing and so on. And watched out over him. And was his main advisor. And for years, for most of those 38 years in the desert, she was his chief advisor. I do this with the midrash, but she dies. What happens when the woman dies? Most of us Humans This is his reliance outside of himself on the planet. So this, I think, is the preparation for him. It's like, Remove the feminine from contact for a little bit more. She's going to have to grow this in herself. You can't rely on your sister. You know, and she's taking the position I got to take care of Moshe. I got to take care of certain things. Or, but that's also just another way of taking care of Moshe. And I'm still his older sister. And blah, blah. So I think there's that going back to the old pattern that have been out of it for a long time, seeing it's like saying, you know, getting into your elder years, you think you're ball and all of a sudden something comes up from childhood <laughs> just and kidding that was the girl and the boy and oh, it's like, no. <laughs> well, well, no the, really. the different way that goes away is that you can notice it and then you don't let it take hold right. you don't act it you see it you notice it ah, I love it yeah, yeah. You know, I like your energy so, you know, your energy is great but in this case I'm in charge now I need to take care of myself thank you mm -hmm. I'll take your advice and your consideration it's so beautiful because it is healing like, yeah. something deeply between them. Yeah. Because rather than Moshe feeling bad that they spoke to Shana about his marriage, he immediately his response is to say to Hashem also to pick up the azut. If you don't heal her, I will. You, you taught me how to do this. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, I will. What's this word azut? No, azut from the word ez, goat. Um, okay, so she also has, remember, she's the midwife and she's the doula. When people are in states of disconnection, it is her job and her role to get involved. So once again, she thinks, I need to help him birth his marriage, birth his connection to the feminine. Connect, he's, he's disconnecting his body and his soul. He's disconnecting the light from the vessel. Right? That's what he's, she's essentially saying to him. None of the avot, right, did this. We don't have to disconnect light from vessels. It's the opposite. We need lights in vessels. Right? And Hashem steps in and says, Yes, but often probably you're right. In general, you're right. But here, you're dealing with the 50th date. So it's really not, you really don't know the rules here. It's also, Shlomo teaches this thing that what do we know? We really don't know what the agreement between Sephora and Shlomo. Sephora is in such a hard thing that they actually have an agreement. So that then she would have come to Miriam to sort of complain. If that was but I don't know if the big rush, I don't know if the big rush is in this book. The way she's been learning lately, and I invite you all to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Try to not do either or, try oh. to layer, layer, 
this is true and this is true and this is true and and then what what's the picture that that gives me if it's all oh, but true this. at the same time but but i mean in the specific story right because instead of learning this is true or that is true how could this be true if that's true right and now put it because isn't it true within our, ourselves or oh, what i really want to marry this person and i really don't want to marry this person i mean don't don't we have that within our own being parts of us want this and not but and part of me wants that and we start to practice the dance of the parts <laughs> this is just as true if not more so because these are our archetypes right it's not this it's not she being penning to lot this or that it's what if all 70 faces are simultaneously true at the same time, and imagine the ayin that gets redeemed from being the letter of separation into the letter of the greatest unity, what we call Mahut. And Asa, the healing of Asa and Yaakov. So, Part of what's happening here is that Moshe is teaching the Am and Miriam is teaching the Am the Koach of Tfilah. The Koach of Tfilah, the power of prayer to heal. That when someone is suffering, right, Tfilah, there's something about this energy that has the power to overcome nature. To transform nature. Why does she need to be part of the story? We said she's about transforming, elevating the ma, the bitter, to the root, to the highest integration, and to to that, and to song and thanksgiving. So if you have two eyes, and those eyes are iron, and those two eyes see really, they work together, and so they see one. And color is the one who heals her by seeing beyond what the regular eyes see, because he saw with a different kind of eye. And so he would bring that out in her by. If you own me, you could call it now. And because that you could heal. Because he could see the potential. No, he could see a different level of reality that just is up with the two eyes, the dichotomy of the two eyes that are the separating eyes. Oh, I'm missing. No, I'm just totally off track. I just want to go back. No, gorgeous. I just had flashed where I was thinking of the two eyes 70 plus 70, which gives us 140, which gives us the word come, who, stand upright. Right. So you know, to, to see what is already there, or to see the potential. Okay, I have to bring this here. Right? Okay. This, okay. this is from the this is from the Yalkut Kamelili on Mishle Parak Kafzain Sasuk I can give you guys also more reports. I didn't tell you every single report. Sometimes I find it interrupts my flow. But if you want, Nicole, you can ask me or write me. This is Mahasha Kabbalah, the piece of Torah. So it says, she was shut out of the camp for seven days. So isn't this interesting? She's going back to her childhood memory of being the Azuma for seven days. For seven days. Right? Right? She's going, this is. She's had the experience before mm. of being outcast, oh. right, as a child. So she went back to her childhood place, well. And now, Hazal, come and tell us here, what are we supposed to learn from this? It says for seven days, she's outside the camp, right? She has to have a deep, homeopathic experience and remembrance of what it COVID, right? 
of what it feels like to have no relationship except her and God, her and herself. Right? She somehow, in her slight misunderstanding of relationship, she has to have homeopathic healing and restoration to remind her of the value of human connection, to remind her that we may not necessarily understand connections from the outside. We're not in them. Um, but then Chazal come and say, this is the Yalku Tamiru. Some prayers are only answered in a hundred years. Some prayers are only answered in 90 years. I want to just remind all of you, this is code. It's very specific. How come Chazal don't say some prayers are answered in a thousand years? Some prayers are answered in two days. What these numbers is code. These are Ru'ula codes, okay? Some prayers are only answered in a hundred years, some in 90 years, and some in seven days, like in Miriam's case. And what was the prayer? Anna, Elna, so remember when she was little, she was sick, she was a holy, and she was outcast. And now here she is again, sick, a holy. What's a holy? One who casualizes something that's kadosh. Vachol hamagdil bein kodesh vachol, separating the kedusha from the holy, and sometimes we only get back into the kedusha through the experience of hamagdil, right? Like separating, having the experience of being separate and alone. And she was the opposite. She did not casualize something holy. I mean, she, I mean, she felt this is holy. So. I'm saying in general, when we say use the word whole, like a few days, whole. The casualizing was that she thought that she could talk about his intimate life with his wife. Even because I'll say she had the highest purest, purest intentions for unity and unifying them. Hashem's, what, why? Okay, so, oh, she left. Okay, well, so you're going to record it. What is something we've been learning this whole month? When does anger arise? What is it a sign of? A boundary has been reached. Anger, anger is a sign that a boundary has been reached. So it's actually a help. It's a good thing. It's, a, it's like Hasasalam, 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 Hasasalam. Somebody would put their hand into a fire and the pain reaction would give them information. Don't do that again. Don't breach that boundary or you'll get hurt, right? Similarly, say Hazal, right? When Hashem responds with Chalon Af, with anger, it's in response to a border has been crossed that should was casualized. That was what was casualized. For example, when Nadav and Abihu go into the Kodesh Kadoshi, number one in a state of Shikila, right? That's casualizing the intimacy of the experience, right? They didn't mean to casualize it, by the way. Again, remember that we're keeping all 70 Faces of Torah true and active at the same time. They were also to the king of They were also doing it the Shem Shemayim to show on Israel not to catch what happens when you casualize holiness, right? 
Does that make sense? That they, the Shang Shemayin, if they agree to give up their lives so that Amistar would learn this lesson so that no one else would have to pay a price of casualizing holes and things that are holy, right? All of these 70 layers are simultaneously true at the same time, right? They also were in a state of Ratzel, without show, right? Ratzel, Ratzel, more light, more light, more taiku, more taiku, more closeness. It, it pains them to have to be in Ratzel show, which is another way of saying body and soul, body and soul. They just wanted to get out of the body thinking that the deepest way happens when we shed our body. Once again, showing us, right? But here, then Miriam is saying, oh, okay, right? So if this is the lesson that body and soul should always be joined, she's trying to apply the lesson, right? But Hashem's Chawan comes in and says, listen, there are places that even you are not allowed in. This is between me and motion. Intimacy. Intimacy has borders. Privacy. Not secrets, because that's shame-based. The opposite, preciousness. Some things are so precious, we don't have the right to even comment on because it's so precious. So she put it down to motion. I can't pretend to know these answers because I don't. I just, I think it's what we're just bringing up is beautiful questions of exploration, right? We don't know, but we know the homeopathic remedy. So perhaps from the remedy, to no, to be separated from everybody specifically for seven days and to turn pure white, right? Understand every one of these details is a part of the healing and the restoration. One, that it's only her and it's not Tikora and it's not Aro. Two, that she has to go back again and feel what is that experience of feeling ugly. I, I remember this from my childhood, of feeling sick a feeling abandoned, a feeling rejected, a feeling disconnected, right? Three, specifically for seven days and on the eighth day, right? If Moshe says, right, Moshe does say she's now healed and she can come back in. Not God, it's Moshe who brings her back in, right? Um, Right? And um, and the whole arm waits for her. So she's also learning some deep lesson about cover. Wow. Her own cover, Moshe's cover, Sikora's cover, the cover of the intimacy of husband and wife. Hashem doesn't like when we mess around with the cover of intimacy between husbands and wives. That was something else that we learned. How careful we have to be, even and especially when we have really good intentions for Shlom Rai. How careful. Mm -hmm. Freaking myself out by saying this out loud because it's really powerful. Um, right? She has to learn that there's something about the cloth of to do that that can overcome this experience and sweeten it and relieve her suffering. And it's specifically the prayer of the person who harmed her. Isn't that a big trauma? I mean, I'm so sorry, who she harmed, is what I meant to say, right? How awesome. Does that mean that we should go to somebody who we harmed and ask them to pray for us? Why? That sounds very powerful. Imagine we hurt somebody, and not only do we go and say, I'm sorry, we say, because I so deeply harmed your neshama, I'll never be whole again unless Dafka, you can pray for me. Well, mm -hmm. That's very powerful. That's right. 
why have how come it wasn't Carla when you played? When she Carla, or if she played for herself, why did it take the prayer of the person who she hurt? Mm -hmm. Is it much more so than somebody hurt you and you pray for them without them asking? Absolutely. And this is one of the very big tenets of 12 step work. If someone harms you, see if you can get yourself to pray for them. By the way, it's not always, it's a process sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it bypasses the work that needs to get done. Um, so now we have this amazing piece of Torah that we talked about, right? Her being the Azuba, that was one of her names. She was left and abandoned from her beginnings because she was sick and not pretty. And Torah comes and teaches us, listen to this, the Shon. This is from the Gemara of Sota Yubet Amalal. Kalev built her by marrying and the way that the Torah goes through his lineage, the Yehus, it says, right, he was married to, and it says this woman, her name is Isha Azura, right? And then and then it talks about the children, right, that he had. On the surface, it seems that he might have been married to two different women and had children with different women. And along comes the Pini to Tola and says, no, he married a woman who had the experience of being two different women. He married the woman that had the experience of being not pretty and being sickly and being abandoned. And he gave her the experience of being the woman that is healthy and beautiful. And the Shon of the Torah is Mali Benefa. It brings me tears. And by doing so, both of them, right, um, right she's showing the power of the Mayim, the cream of feminine waters, and he's showing the power of the Mayim Dukri, the masculine powers, the koach of being in Shia, how much a man can elevate and change a woman. And he brings her into this full, her full power, not by making her small. Building her. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. It's both. That's the whole thing. It's both. She's one woman with both the ability to receive from her husband and build and reconnect. She's so gorgeous. I think we there's so much more. I'm, so I just, I, I want to give us time to digest wow. because I'm a glutton for Torah. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and, and. But I think that maybe we should pause because we perceive so much. Do we that after the Sarah? That's what I remember. But after she went through that, then she got that feeling. Yes. And I have a problem that she saw a Zoom or whatever. Because look at that she five, she's you know going out every day. She, I didn't make this up. I, I know, but it just doesn't make sense to me. She seems like such a strong person, not yeah. somebody that's whoa, stop, 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 stop. I got it. Yeah. Uh, I You've never seen women have the experience that because they're so powerful. And angry, isn't that the, the typical, the angry woman? The, what is that? Is it enough? Abandoned. I mean, she was involved in the community. Um, maybe she wasn't in her heart so much so, but 
Just, 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 just I, I, so I, again, I ask, has anybody in this room ever had the feeling that because of your anger, you felt then less desirable, less feminine, less attractive because of the fiery anger that you have? I have many women like that. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it's like I mean, I, I don't want to say coarse language, but that's the typical thing. Women are called an angry, angry feminine dog, dog, which is interesting that her husband's name is Dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Well, it's hard to see it. I think it's hard to see it in yourself. So maybe in somebody else, if you see somebody get angry, it's not really attractive, right? Like, if you see somebody getting nice. angry... I mean, just I let's mean, start with that first story. Right, right. She's five years old, yeah, right. okay? Let's start with the first story. Haro wants to have her killed. How much did he feel threatened? Haro, by a five-year-old. So who did she think was ever going to have vessels with her power? That's an interesting way to learn it, right? If Paro felt so threatened by this little five year old, what was she like as a woman? And who's going to have vessels for that holy strength and power? And, and, and wait, let's add more. She's, she's a doula, she's a midwife, she's a dancer, she, she's a singer. She is not scared of blood, she's not scared of death. She's like, what a force! Yeah. It doesn't fit that she's sick and she's a man, you know, it's like a whole different kind of personality. So it, it, it sounds like it sounds like, like number four. Like I was mm -hmm. just trying to figure out like why why Dafka she had to be put in isolation for seven days. And why did why did she have to face her childhood pain and suffering? Because you know, she needed that humility, she needed she needed to be on it because she stepped over the boundary. She stepped over the border that, you know, we said, oh, she has a gift of being able to, like, try and bring the, the, the masculine women together. And she, out of shock, she did well until it got to Moshe and Tepor, where I was saying, you stepped over the boundary. And so you, she needed to be, I guess, reminded of that, of that sacred, that sacred border. But why, but why alone? I guess, like, I guess you always learn your lessons alone. I don't know. I can so say for myself, I have been divorced since 1994. And the value that I have for marriage and connection is very different because it's a doesn't mean, I mean, that I can or could or I'm ready or anything else, but it means that what happened with COVID and Corona, we began to value human connection. All the silly little connections we took for granted, getting on a bus, going to the grocery store, right, going out to eat, just the value of human connection. I'm not saying this is Miriam's problem, I'm just saying, right? Right. It was like a homeopathic remedy, um, right, for the value of human connection, the value. I know that I casualize relationships in my past. I don't. I, 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 I haven't seen my parents for almost four years, right? It's like, you know, the people who are close to us tend to be the people that we have the most work around. But what if you then can't see them? You can't hug them. You can't talk to them. You can't just jump on a plane and go see them, you know? Um, how does that change our perspective? And something else, um, again, I would share from a personal experience. I never understood that when I'm in a relationship with somebody, I don't make that relationship. Hashem brought that person into my life. And Hashem could just as easily take that person out of my life. And that's been one of my most painful lessons of 
Don't casualize any relationship. Don't take it for granted. Because, I mean, something that I learned after these, over these last years, somebody who I had very, very, very deep love for in my heart. And I made a lot of mistakes in the relationship, but I, I often sit with this. I didn't literally sing hallelujah and thank Hashem every day for the time I did share with that person. And when it got removed, because I, I was like, well, they're not this. I wish they were more that. I wish it was a little more like this and a little bit less like that, right? And I was so focused on the lack that I didn't understand. Do you understand if Hashem puts a child, a, a parent, a lover, a husband, a friend, that's not a given. It's not a given that we're given an opportunity for connection and relationship. So don't casualize them. Don't just open our mouths and start talking about other people. And I'm saying this to myself, by the way. I have lots of work to do around this. I'm not saying this outside the camp. I'm saying a deep thing that I learned, and I made a huge mistake by speaking about intimacy that I shared with other people. Yes, and all good intentions. All yeah. good, no, that's a lie, okay? <laughs> but largely with good intentions, sometimes with terrible intentions, I'm sorry to say. But I try, right, to elevate my intentions. But Hashem removed the person from my life. And to this day it hurts. And now I understand Every time you give me an opportunity for, for love, oh my goodness, may I warm them, may I elevate them, may I not focus on the mal, the merlut, the bitterness, what's not working for me in this connection, but may I elevate them, may they elevate me, may we leave each other better people for having been in one another's lives. You know, and and um, and maybe bring it to a level of moment. Now I wish that every moment that that man was in my life, I would have woke up singing for joy, instead of how I need to change, how he needs to change, what needs to change, how God gave me something, but it's not what I really wanted. It could have been. A now I say, wow, I had an opportunity and look who her husband is. Halem, to from my heart say, it is not a given that you brought this person in my life. And I wish that I would have come to the Kesher from the perspective of you are the answer to my prayer. You are a living miracle in my life. You are an opportunity for me to practice relationship. I was going to say back to your question about the abandonment. My sense is that it's an internal thing. I'm going to, I'm going to say that I'm for you. So that is share sure. my Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Stop it completely. Stop, and then it will go to the sound.